Hey everyone, in this video, I wanna teach you a psychological technique that you can use to help you make a lot more money in your reselling business. You know, it's been very interesting uh, doing this whole reselling job while also working full time as a neuropsychologist in a hospital. And I was reminded of this the other day uh, when I did my live show that not everybody who's currently watching my channel realizes that that's what I do on the side. I've mentioned it before, uh, but there are people who are saying in the chat that they didn't even realize that that was something that, that I did. So I figured it was worth bringing up again. It got me thinking about this topic because one of the things that I have been uh, fascinated with in going out uh, to all these different sales is the phenomenon where I continue to find really valuable items continuously left behind at the end of sales. It could be at the very end of a one-day sale or it could just be laying around there at the end of a two-day sale. Um, I'm going to show a bunch of uh, examples of things uh, like this, uh, most of which I've just kind of found uh, laying around or, you know, if it's not something that was at the very end of a sale, it's still been sitting there for quite a while and no one picked it up yet, despite the fact that uh, all of these places that I'm going to, there are many resellers who are going and seeing these same exact items and continuously uh, passing up on them. So, um, you know, I find it interesting because although I specialize in neuropsychology in which I am assessing patients with brain injury and brain disease, um, at its very core, psychology is the study of human behavior. And so uh, I am very, very focused on that, uh, not just in my regular job, but also outside of it. I like to apply a lot of those uh, principles to all sorts of things uh, that I do, and one of which is business. And so I feel like that's something something uh, unique that I could bring to you on this channel, those types of insights. I've done a lot of videos with you. Uh, if you go into my playlist section uh, right over here, you'll see it says playlist. There's a section there on negotiations and lowballing. So if you're new to my channel and you haven't seen those, I would strongly encourage you to go check those out because you'll learn a lot of psychological tricks and tips and insights to help you negotiating with uh, buyers to also make more money in your reselling business. But I'm going to take you through uh, at least 10 examples. I might even throw in a bonus item here to get across the, the point that I want to try to, to make to you about how to uh, use this insight I want to share with you. So um, just at its very uh, basic core, uh, there's really two main reasons that, or I guess you could say three, why people would leave things behind um, that are valuable. So number one would just be laziness. They don't want to really do too much investigation into it, so they just leave it behind. So that would be number one. Uh, number two would be someone just lacks the knowledge of what something is. And that's very common. And that happens to everybody. We, we've all passed up uh, certain things that later on we might learn is valuable. You know, a good example of something that I could have easily done uh, before I started studying up on uh, clothing is I could easily have walked into a thrift store, found a pair of Christian Louboutin shoes, not realized what the red bottoms uh, meant or signified, and put them down and walked right out. And someone else could have came by and you know picked those up for ten bucks and sold them for a couple of hundred dollars. So uh, that type of stuff happens, and the counter to that. The way you've got to address that and fix that is you just got to you got to work in terms of educating yourself, studying by watching videos, by reading you know bolo guides, by you know um, just uh, doing whatever you can, getting experience, checking comps, all those sorts of things could help with that. But there is a third reason why these types of things continuously are missed, and I don't really hear it talked about. It may have been talked about. I just haven't heard it before and I've been thinking about it a lot, which is people are not always thinking about who the buyer is on the other end that would be interested in paying up for that particular item. You've got to understand why someone would pay up for that particular item, even if, and this is crucial, it's so crucial, even if it's something you are not interested in. That is something that's so important to break out of the mold of. I've said this before, but if you are not interested in tools or if you're not interested in collecting postcards or old photos, there very well might be someone else who is doing that stuff and willing to pay up big money 
for that item that's sitting right in front of you, even though you care less about it. You know, certainly there are people who collect this type of stuff, but those people might be the ones who are willing to pay up for something that you could care less about. So you've got to know that those people are out there. You just have to have that basic knowledge. And keep in mind that for most items that you're going to come across, not all, but for most, there's a collector out there somewhere for it. Always remember that. So let me take you through some examples of things. Uh, this would be one that I sold uh, recently. Uh, I picked this up for a couple bucks at a garage sale. It was sitting around at the uh, second day of the sale. Now this is the, the same garage sale where I picked up the Kiss pencils for free that sold for $237.50. I did a whole video on that if you didn't check that out. And then I sold three other pairs that this guy just gave me. And the guy, I told you, he was a motorcycle guy. He was a biker and he was just giving a lot of stuff away. But this particular item was out for sale. He was not giving this one away for free. Uh, I bought it off of him for a couple bucks and I remember the sale very vividly. And there were a lot of people, there were resellers there. Um, there were people who were of the generation of Evil Knievel, that's who this is right here. If uh, Evil Knievel is uh, beyond uh, your time, you know, you're relatively young or something, Evil Knievel uh, is a famous uh, a stunt artist, He's very, very popular in the 1970s, and so they made a lot of toys, uh, particularly through uh, the company Ideal. They made action figures uh, like this, and you can see he still has the helmet there, and uh, he also has, uh, here he has a stunt cycle, and they made many versions of the stunt cycle, and of the action figure. This is just one uh, particular version. Now it's true that there will be some people who would come across this and not recognize that this is Evil Knievel. Even though it does say EK on there, I mean, that is a clue, but there are gonna be people who don't realize that. So that gets into that second group of people I was talking about who just, they just don't have the knowledge about that. And you know, you can get that. You just gotta, you know, like I said, do all those other things to acquire that. But in this video, what I'm talking about is the person who knows this is Evil Knievel. And again, there were people who definitely would have known that who picked this up, but they still left it there. And again, I, I picked this up for a couple bucks, wound up selling, you see it says $150. I sold it within 24 hours for $130. This piece plus the motorcycle. Now, why would people who know this is Evil Knievel put it down? One of the most common reasons for this, and you're going to see this is a theme through a lot of items, is people are going to think, you know, I know that's Evil Knievel. Yeah, haha, -ha, Evil Knievel. He did a lot of stunts and stuff, but kids don't know Evil Knievel now. Kids don't care about that. Kids want Spider-Man, right? They want um, Iron Man. They want all the people who are on the, you know, in the Marvel Comics um you know, movies and stuff. They don't care about this guy who they don't even know, so they figure it's not worth anything. But what they don't realize, and this is what you, again, this is why it's important to realize there's collectors for everything. There are people who are older. There are even people, though, who are younger, who are interested in Evil Knievel. They're motorcycle enthusiasts. They're also toy enthusiasts. Try to think of how many different niches there could be in a particular item. So what do you have in this one? You have this could appeal to vintage toy collectors. This can appeal to vintage uh, motorcycle enthusiasts or any motorcycle enthusiast. Uh, and it could uh, also obviously appeal to people who collect Evil Knievel stuff. Now, some of you might be saying, what do you mean collect Evil Knievel stuff? There's people out there that actually co collect Evil Knievel stuff? Yes, yes, there's people out there to do that. Uh, here's a perfect example of somebody uh, uh, right here. I'll show you his uh, his picture in a few minutes, but this is part of this guy's collection. Uh, he's put together basically a museum all dedicated to Evil Knievel stuff, and this is all stuff that this guy has privately collected. Now, a lot of the stuff you're going to see here is the real higher-end stuff like clothing and you know actual motorcycles and stuff like that, but... There are, and there's, you know, you see a helmet and stuff, but I'll show you the guy in just a second. He's going to come up here towards the end. This is him. But um, there are also people who are collecting the toy figures and stuff as well. It's harder nowadays to find these 1970s uh, Evil Knievel pieces, uh, especially finding them connected as a unit like this. So people will pay up for them and they'll pay up for them fast. Uh, there is an episode of American Pickers 
you know, mentioned in the comments if you saw it, there was a guy there who collected Evil Knievel stuff just like this guy. And I thought back to that when I saw this piece and I said, you know, I know that there was that guy in American Pickers who was paying up for kind of stuff this guy was paying for, but he was also paying for toys. This guy was literally paying for hairs of Evil Knievel, spoons, forks that he supposedly ate food from, napkins, all sorts of stuff. So I'm thinking to myself, if there's people out there, if there's even just you know one or two guys that I know of that are doing that, there's definitely more. And they're out there, and they're looking for this stuff on eBay. And again, proof is in the pudding. That's why I wanted to start this off with an item here that just recently sold. Again, $130 piece, sitting there, picked it up for $4, left there into the second day of a two-day sale just a few bucks. Let's go to another one. Now, I showed this one recently, and some of these are things that you have seen before if you watch my channel, but I'm giving you a new, a little bit of a new insight into it. So this here is a laser disc player. I, I showed you this one. In fact, you may remember me uh, showing you relatively recently, it's a big Panasonic, the video where I found it. And I'll just kind of talk through it because you see it here. This is the second day of the estate sale. So this was left there for one full day. It's right there in that corner, right on the floor. Now that could be part of the laziness part, right? So people just don't want to bend down, pick up a heavy item. And when I talked about this piece before, I said there were some other reasons why some people might have left it behind. One reason is because um, it's big and bulky. Another reason is because the cord is missing in the back. So I had to go buy a replacement cord, but I got the piece for $5. The replacement cord was only eight bucks. And I wound up selling it for $190. So the other reason though why people would leave something like this behind is again thinking that because it's old technology and no one is using uh, laser discs anymore, quote unquote, no one is using laser discs anymore, that um, there's not going to be people who are in the market for something like this. But that is not uh, true. Now, while it is true that laser discs are not a huge market, there is a specialty niche area that will pay up for certain laser discs, particularly the real limited edition laser discs. There weren't many prints of them. Um, there are ones that were printed in Japan or Hong Kong or even some US ones that had limited prints, like a few hundred of them. And people who collect this stuff who are really hardcore into laser discs, I mean, they hoard those kind of items. And you know, it's rare that sometimes they'll let them go. So if you happen to, there are some laser discs that are worth a lot of money, but there are also ones that are, are near near worthless. But the, at, its, at its core, what someone's going to need who is a laser disc collector is they're obviously going to need a laser disc player. And laser disc players can go for big money, just like this one did. And there are no problems. You know, uh, it works fine. A uh, person got it. You know, no complaints, nothing like that. So, um, the thing about trying to remember also about that there are some laser disc players. Uh, collectors out there who, again, this is who I'm envisioning. I'm envisioning the, the guy who maybe his laser disc player broke down and he needs a new one and he's a laser disc collector and he's in the market for one. Or someone just recently started to get into laser disc collecting and needs a laser disc player. Now you might ask yourself, by the way, why would someone get into that? Why not just focus on the DVDs? Well, the thing about laser discs, laser discs were how you know, when they were, people were first putting things out on like a big disc before they did DVDs, that was the first time that the movies were coming out on that type of, you know, circular disc format. And there are uh, many movies where there are parts of a movie. I mean, remember, this is physical media. This isn't digital media. I mean, it's physical media that people want to preserve it. They're like film historians because there are some segments of films that are found on the laser disc transfer that are not present on the DVD transfer. And so there are people out there that study this that have tens of thousands of laser discs for the sole purpose of preserving physical media. So there's a whole segment of people out there. I'm not saying it's millions of people, but there are people out there for that. So again, it gets into having that knowledge and thinking about who is the customer that's going to pay up for this type of thing. And so um, that's another example. I I'll give you some others here as well. Um, this is one I showed recently uh, in my Facebook group, and I recently did a YouTube uh, video about it uh, a couple back. This is this uh, vintage uh, Motorola a Volkswagen uh, a Beetle car radio that, you remember, I wound up pulling it out of this uh, white box 
uh, that you see here. And you could see there, you know, there, there's a radio on the front. I mean, you could tell that there's a radio in there. Now, when I flipped it over, I told you I could tell from looking at the speakers that there was a Motorola speaker. And so, you know, that led me to believe there was some potential value in the radio. And then when I, you know, took everything out of it, once I got back, I picked this up for $3. This again was the, uh, actually, it wasn't even the second day. It was, it was the last day of the sale. This guy had this, this basement open with people coming in all week. And this was one of, if not the only thing, in fact, it's the only thing I picked up that was left behind that day. But when I pulled it out and later on, on in the video, I, I wind up showing it. Uh, and I'll just, I know I showed it the other day in my, in my video, but, um, the thing about it that I was thinking of was I'm thinking of the guy who, when he, or it could be the lady, right. Who is doing some kind of uh, vintage, uh, car repair for this specific, um, radio, the specific car, and they need parts to it. They are going to have a near impossible task ahead of them getting that piece. And if you ever watch things like, um, um, uh, the vintage car uh, restoration show uh, that, that, that the guy Danny does, who's on um, uh, Pawn Stars, he comes in as the car expert. Um, you know, when they need those parts, they got to pay up for those parts when they're going to find them and they're doing a restoration job and there's time limits and stuff like that. And they're going to they're gonna pay up for it. Uh, or if you watch American Restoration, same thing. I mean, they've got to find the parts. So remember, I kept this listed as $100 for months because in my vision, when I bought this, and I probably said this in the original video, if you go back and look at it, I was waiting. It's almost like, think of it this way. Think of a, um, of being like a spider sometimes who's leaving a trap, okay? And you're just waiting for the fly to come by. And then as soon as they come by, boom, you've got them. Because this is like, you know, I'm waiting for that fly to come by who's looking to get this particular piece for their restoration project. And once they need it, you know, they, they're going to pay the price. Remember, the guy was asking me, oh, you know, what's the lowest you could do, whatever. And I said, this is the price. And then the guy wound up buying it um, a few minutes later. So you've got to put yourself in situations where you also have leverage. I've talked about that a lot before, but there's a, you know, a psychology to that as well. So this is one of these situations where, you know, unlike, let's say maybe this one here, right? This one here is not one that I would say I'm envisioning a buyer that necessarily needs it. This is something that someone might just, they might want as part of their collection that they're building. Um, this person here might need a um, certain type of laser disc player. They don't necessarily need this one, but they, they need one. So, that, you know, they're in the market for it. So I want to definitely, of course, make sure my price is competitive. But in this one, I'm thinking of the buyer that needs just this one. That's what I'm thinking of. So you've got to think about long tailing items because there's certain items that, you know, just going to have to wait for a while to get that high price. An item like this one, that'll sell, you know, sell faster because there's um, more people looking for something like this than this. So sometimes you're waiting for a specialty person to come along and sometimes you're appealing to more of a broader base. Uh, this one here, I know Carl's watching this. So, uh, Carl, shout out to you. Cause Carl bought this, uh, you know, you'll see Carl in the comment section. He's a, he's a great, uh, uh, member and of the, uh, ch channel, a, a subscriber, I should say. And, um, when I saw this, this is another great example. I actually thought of Carl when I, when I got this and I thought of people uh, like Carl. And when I say people like Carl, what do I mean? I mean, I'm thinking of Halloween collectors and I'm thinking of uh, people who like horror type of stuff. Now, if you remember the estate sale where I found this, and I'll show you this too. This was towards the uh, end of the sale. It was the one of the last items that I bought, if you go back to this video, and I just found it sitting there in the basement. Everybody had gotten to that basement before, before I did. I was focused on other areas of the house when I first got in, and this just sitting there. And, um, you know, people left it there, I believe, because for this one, Okay, yeah, there's not like a maker's mark on it, but I think the main thing with this one is people did not have a vision of who the heck would get a piece like this and how exactly would you market that. Now, in that house, there was a lot of other Native American types of items, and that's what I believe that piece is. It's really a Native American piece, but when I looked at it, I said, how could I take this piece right here and how could I remarket it to, to somebody? 
And so the way I really looked at it was um, displaying it like you would one of those Halloween items, you know, if you go out and what I thought of when I saw that, I thought of setting it up like this, you know, when you go and you see on someone's lawn where there's a head and there's the two hands coming out of the grass, that's what I thought. So market this as like a hag, old woman type of thing, so, you know, some type of Halloween type item, something that a horror person would like, even though, again, that was not really what the original design for this was. This was not designed to be a Halloween piece. Now, it had the added bonus that in that same video, I got to uh, scare Mrs. Primetime with it by putting it in the refrigerator. So if you did it, putting the head in the refrigerator, her dad was in on the joke and you could hear her yelp out when, when it totally in real time. Uh, nothing fake or set up about that whole thing. It was just, it was totally hilarious. So uh, go check out that video. It was pretty funny if you want to see that. But um, again, that that's the point. Sometimes you, I'm trying to show you different ways to envision who your customer uh, would be on the other end to pick this up. And sure enough, Carl wound up picking this up for uh, for for eighty five dollars. Uh, so thank you, Carl, uh, for the, for the purchase. Uh, I really do uh, appreciate the support. So uh, let's see, how many items have we gone through so far? That has been uh, one item, two items. I lose count sometimes. There's three, there's four. So let's get to a fifth one here. This one, uh, and you'll see this again most likely in my what's sold video at the end of the month, but this one I just sold a couple days ago. This is a vintage uh, Kellogg uh, telephone. It's a, now this one actually happens to be a reproduction. If it was a real Kellogg telephone, it could go for you know three hundred dollars or something like that you know somewhere along that range. But Kellogg telephones have a distinctive look to them. Uh, they have this um, uh, little well, there's different types, there's different styles, but they have this little cradle on the side and they have this little wood plank. I'll show you different models of it right here if you're not familiar. Uh, you can see right here uh, there's whole pages on the internet devoted to Kellogg phones. Um, and you could just scroll down and see there's all different types and they're, they're wall mounted ones for the most part but there are these cradle phones right here this number one if you find one like that those could sell for uh, up to $600 so there's some crazy money involved in uh, Kellogg uh, phones and um, there's also a member of my Facebook group I don't want to shout out her first name because I don't per ask her permission for that but uh, her last name is Kellogg and she was also telling me this week that if you see anything with the last name Kellogg Kellogg was a very very big name. They made a lot of, uh, there are a lot of inventions that came through Kellogg, a furniture piece, all sorts of stuff, uh, letters and stationery with uh, Kellogg on it. If you see anything Kellogg related, that's just a little side bolo tip I'm giving you here. Uh, pick it up. You may even want to have it appraised because some of that stuff could go for tons and tons of money. We're talking like hundreds of thousands of dollars, even potentially more in the right auction format. But for right now, I'm focusing on the phones and the thing you have to keep in mind with wall decor. I sell a lot of wall decor core right think about it I saw a lot of signs I saw a lot of posters right and this is another example of wall decor so you don't even have to know necessarily about the Kellogg phone you didn't have to know it's called the Kellogg phone proof of this that I will tell you is that this was actually picked up by my wife Mrs. Primetime uh, for $10 at the front of a thrift store. We don't normally source at thrift stores, but we were going to a community garage sale and the place to get the map was at the thrift store for the community. So we went there and outside there was a guy set up and he just had this there. And um, he, he was, I couldn't believe the price. He's selling it for $10. Uh, we picked it up and sold it for 110 bucks. So uh, it was a great, uh, it was a great sale. And you know, my wife, Miss Primetime, she didn't know that it was called the Kellogg phone. She just knew that it looked cool. It looked cool, looked neat. And we both envisioned this going to somebody who would want to have this up as a display piece and who would just love to look at something like that. So remember that with vintage items, even there's a lot of money in vintage and a, lot, a large reason for that is there's a nostalgia to it and people just love to look at it. In fact, when I posted this piece in my Facebook group, I had responses from people who told me that they have actual Kellogg phones in their house and they love walking by it because they love the feeling it gives them. Think, remember that, there's emotion attached to that. What are they saying? They love the feeling. It makes them feel good. The stuff around them makes them feel good. So I'm thinking, and my wife is thinking, you know, this is who we want to get this piece to. Someone who's going to have an emotional attachment to wanting to see this type of piece around, you know, decorating their house. So uh, that's another, uh, another example right here. So that was number five. Uh, this one here, 
Uh, number six, this is uh, the 1977 Arvin heater, which was literally, I literally remember, picked this off of the trash heap. Uh, this was being thrown out in a big pickup day. I didn't spend any money for it, so it's literally being uh, tossed out. Came in the original box, if you remember. So here's the original box for this piece right here. Um, got it home, tested it, worked. And one of the things that um, you need to know about old electronic pieces, and I've told told you about this before with um, with the power to, with the power tools that I have sourced before, the old uh, vintage power tools is that the way things were constructed back then is completely different than how things are constructed now. And this is especially important for people who are getting into reselling, who are teenagers or who are, you know, in their, you know, younger, you know, 20s, early 20s, um, you know, who maybe, you know, weren't around when I was younger, for example, to see the stuff that my parents had, or even back then that was being constructed. Um, but then just things just started getting mass produced and cheapened and don't work the same way now that they, that they did, uh, back then. And so the vintage uh, Arvin heater is a great example of it. I mean, you could even see here, like in this video, this is a smaller version of the Arvin heater. And when I press play here, you're going to see, uh, when this guy turns it on, look how fast that turned on. You see that how quickly that went on. That's exactly what happened when, uh, you know, when I turned uh, mine on. Same exact type of thing. I mean, and people love that. There's people who love the Arvin uh, heater. Now, you don't even have to know that people love the Arvin heater. You might say, well, that's specialty, you know, knowledge that someone would like that. No, you don't even have to know that. All you have to know, what I thought of when I picked this up is that the winter is right around the corner. And I actually had in my mind some guy you know, now it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go to this guy, but this is what I have in my head. I have in mind some guy sitting in a cabin. Maybe he's all alone. He's sipping on a cup of uh, of uh, hot cocoa or something like that, and he needs a heater. And he's an old school guy. You know, I picture him kind of looking like Santa Claus. He's hanging out there with his, you know, with his with his beard and everything. And uh, you know, maybe he's got a little blanket and he's, you know watching a football game or something and he just he really needs a heater right so uh he can't maybe he maybe he's down on his luck he can't uh you know he he can't really afford an electric bill too much you know he can't pay hundred dollars so he, he just wants to invest in, in something like this so and he knows that it works great because you know he had something like this when he was younger or something like that that's the kind of person that i'm thinking of someone who's just going to want to heat something up with something that they feel is vintage and when they associate old electronic pieces as vintage remember this they're associating it with quality for the most part you know of course part of that does depend on the brand but that's an example of just kind of like a scene in my hat now who knows you know, if the person who really wound up buying it was that, but th that's not the point. The point is, is that you have to have a vision of who that person is on the other end, and that's going to get it. And if you could come up with a logical rationale for it, plus also, of course, you want to check comps. If you could do those things and match those things up together, then it makes sense to make an investment. Now, you might not always have comps. In this instance, I had comps, but if we go back to, for example, this old hag. There was no comps on this. So that could be another reason why some people left it behind, of course, is they didn't have really a way to look it up and figure it out. But that's how you bypass those things. People ask me all the time, what do you do if you're outsourcing and you can't find the comps? Well, this is exactly what you have to do sometimes. This is a strategy. Again, think of who the heck would want that type of thing and would they pay up for it and why? So... Uh, that's, uh, this, well, this one here, number six. So let's go to number, uh, well, let's see. I lost track again. I got to, let's see, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Okay, number six. So now we're on number uh, seven. Now, you might remember this one. This is from my um, my video uh, where I found all those uh, posters in the uh, barn in the middle of nowhere. Well, before I came across those posters, and remember, that barn sale, that was the second day of the sale, and that place was packed from everything the state sale dealer told me, and that place was torn through. And I still found all those posters, again, getting into the whole thing about wall hangings, and I, I talked, go watch that video, I talk about why people left those posters behind. But this one here, uh, and actually, before I get into that, I, I'm gonna show you those books in just a second, because they come after after this but this is a little bonus one for you these little catalogs here uh, this is something I, I, I picked up I pick these up all the time see that it says racing catalog any kind of catalog with tools 
or any type of equipment pieces, even if they're old, that what you have to, and you see me giving the thumbs up there, the reason I'm giving the thumbs up is because I'm envisioning the person who, number one, there's people who just love looking at the old pieces. They just love it. They just, they, they like looking at the pictures, the images, what was available back then. And also, it also gives those people information that they can't readily find necessarily with an internet search. So if they're looking for particular parts and pieces for a particular hobby that they have, maybe it is racing or it could be something else, it could be auto parts, uh, having those manuals handy, even if they're old and outdated and vintage, could be really, really useful for them while they're trying to track down a piece or a part. So any type of old catalogs, ca catalogs like this could be really useful. So that's like an extra, you know, bonus one that I wanted to that I wanted to give you here as well. It just happened to be right behind where I grabbed these books, which you're going to see in a second, which are right there. There they are. That's exactly how I found them, right on the bottom of the box like that. And you'll see as I open this up and I flip through it, um, the book is called, you know, Great Men and and, and Women and stuff and. Uh, I think it's, is women in there or is it just great men? Let me see. Uh, great, yeah, famous men and women. So uh, you'll see here as I flip through it, you're going to see lots of uh, cool black and white photos of uh, of of older men and 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 women. You know, from a long time ago. This book dates back from the 1800s. And the thing to know about this is again has to do with pictures. People love going through old books like this and looking at the old photos of people. They love it. And especially with this set, it actually happened to be a complete one, which is why you have to check up on comps, not just to know the pricing, but also to know if the set is complete or not. And that, you know, that again, that was a, a complete set. Um, I don't know how much I keep flipping through that in that one. I guess I don't show too many other pictures, but you know, there's a couple of examples here in my in my listing here. Um, let's say here's like, you know, one right here. Uh, people love just looking at stuff like this. Anything that has like the black, uh, old black and white art, um, you know, little you know pictures in like this. Uh, people love this. And in the beginning of this book, there's um, you know little captions of, of people who uh, you know real photographs of people who lived a long time ago. And they just they love to look through that stuff. You know, and that's what I'm envisioning. You know, someone who wants just a set like that. It also people love complete sets. They like to you know keep them in their library. It looks kind of cool. You know, sitting like that. You know, the way it's displayed. You know, picture someone with a really cool uh, a library, a really cool study, who would want to have a complete set like that, just even for display. Um, you know, even if it's maybe not a person who's that into looking at the pictures of the uh, older people, they might just want something cool like that, a cool old set from the 1800s that's going to appeal to book collectors and it looks like a nice display piece. And that's why, by the way, I take good care to display my items in certain ways because I want the person to really envision how this is going to, you know, look when they have it. That they're, they're, I'm not just gonna, you know, just kind of lay them all out and scatter them all around. I want to put them like this because this is how this is my first picture because this is how I'm thinking the person is probably going to have them on their bookshelf. So you got to think that uh, when you're marketing uh, the item as well. Um, another one, now this is one that I have not sold yet, but you might remember me sourcing this at the flea market and it was there for many, many hours, prominently displayed, everybody walking by it. It's Indiana Jones and the uh, Infernal Machine. It's an older uh, video game that came out and it is extremely uh, rare to find things associated with it, particularly this display sign. And you could see here, I've had multiple offers on the item. I have it right now listed for $265. I've already made my money back from the other items that I purchased. So this is going to be all profit uh, once I wound up getting this because I got this as part of a, a lot of a, what a bunch of other things for like 20, 25 bucks. And you can see here, this item has 17 watchers on it. Okay. Now, I'm willing to ride this one out. We'll see what it eventually uh, sells for. I've got a dedicated uh, Indiana Jones collector who's already pledged to me multiple times that he will at least pay me $125 for it, but uh, I think I get more for it, so we'll see. But at a minimum, I know I've got a commitment for a $125 sale on this piece. But um, there are people out there, just like I was talking about the Evil Knievel. I mean, you could see here, look at this guy's um, you know, room, and you could find this online. Uh, this guy is just a hard hardcore um, Indiana Jones collector and there are people out there that are like this that they are going to want to complete 
their collection, their completest out there. And if they don't have, look, I could tell you as a collector myself, as a comic collector, and as a collector of other things, you know, I have every, for example, Doctor Who um, uh, VHS tape. I have almost every Doctor Who on, on DVD, except some of the more uh, newer seasons that are out. Uh, but all of the classics I have, even a lot of them on Blu-ray, the people out there, it will drive them crazy not to have a certain piece that's very rare that some other collector in that same genre is going to get. It becomes like bragging rights, like competition. And so that's why I am uh, long-tailing this one because it sometimes becomes a game of chicken almost. It becomes, okay, you really want it. I've got it at a high price. How long are you going to hold out knowing that there's 17 watchers there and, you know, that person's wondering, how long are you going to hold out if I dangle a certain price out there for you, like the 125 or something like that? So, you know, it just depends on where you're at, how, how much you need the money or, or whatever. But, um, you know, this is, again, going back to sometimes, you know, you're thinking of a collector. Sometimes you're thinking of someone who needs something for a repair job. Sometimes you're thinking of someone who needs something for a particular creature comfort, like the heater. There's all sorts of different ways to envision buyers out there, but it's crucial uh, to do that to help you so help yourself make more money with sales. Now, this is one where I am purely uh, playing on the nostalgia piece of this. I'll tell you exactly who I'm thinking of uh, when I got this item. You may remember me sourcing this as one of the last items I wound up sourcing uh, last year at garage sales. Uh, this was at the end of the day, if you remember. This was out on the lawn. I picked it up for $4. It's this old... Uh, uh, GE Vintage Toaster. It came in the original box, which is very hard to find. has five watchers. I've got it up for $135 now. now. I haven't really done this with you before, showing you things that haven't sold yet, but I think it's important to because I want to get across the point. You're going to see these in the What's Sold videos at some point coming up, but um, what I am envisioning for this one is I'm envisioning the person who comes across this item and says this. Here's his... Oh my God. I cannot believe he had this person has this toaster. This was my toaster. And then they yell out to their spouse, honey, honey, you got to see this. This was the toaster. Remember I always told you about this toaster that I had when I was younger? This is the one. I can't believe it. And, you know, it's got to be something. This is going to work only if it's something that's scarce. And this particular piece is a scarce piece. And so there you're getting into the motion and then you're dealing with the, the there's, you know, someone will make an impulse buy. Now, it might take months for that particular person to come across and pay up for that piece. That's why while there, and Craigslist Hunter says this uh, on a lot of his videos, it's true. While there's a lot of money to be made in vintage to really, really make a lot on it, you've got to have a lot of it. And that kind of makes sense, right? Yeah, you need to have a lot to make a lot, but there's a lot of items like this that you do have to long tail and wait for that right person to come along. Just like eventually someone came across and bought that car radio, but you know, I, I had to wait a couple months for that person to come by. And you know, the same thing uh, will, will likely be the case here, but that's okay. You know, um, that's what you got to do for, for some of the pieces. But again, what helps you do that, what helps you psychologically be able to wait and to turn down, for example, a $125 offer, or maybe you might turn down a $60 offer for something like this, even though you bought it for $4, is because you know that person who's going to have that type of reaction is going to come across. Like I said, you're like that you know, uh, you know, you're like that spider coming to my parlor, the spider, uh, uh, said to the fly. So, uh, that's what you're, that's what you're kind of waiting for. It's, 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 it's kind of like that situation. So that's kind of how I like to think of it. Um, one more uh, that I would put up, and this is just one I wanted to put up kind of at the lower end of things for you. Cause I put up a lot of higher priced items, but, uh, these are some James Bond cards out there. Now this is, uh, this is not mine. This is a uh, complete set uh, for the 2004 series by Rittenhouse, uh, James Bond 007. Now, there is a James Bond movie that is going to be coming out in the U.S. in April, and uh, it is sure to be, I would say, or pretty sure to be popular. James Bond movies usually are. Um, but I happen to have uh, some of those cards uh, right here. Now, I don't have... Uh, all of the cards. I do not have the complete set. I got these out of a binder that was filled with all other non-sports collectible cards. Um, some complete sets, uh, some not. But I don't want to throw these out or anything like that. And there's 55 of them. There's supposed to be 100 of them. 
So what do I do, right? I don't want to take the time and piece all these out and try to sell them for, you know, a buck 50 or, you know, plus $2 shipping. And there are plenty of people who are doing that, by the way, with these cards. That's what some, there's some people who do that. Um, so someone, by the way, may want to purchase these for that reason. They might want to purchase all 55 of these for me for like, let's say I'm going to put these up tonight, probably for $14.99. Someone might want to buy that and long tail these cards for $1.49 plus $3 shipping. I'm not going to, going to do that, um, but somebody else might want to do that. But here's another more important kind of person who I'm thinking of who would spend the money for a for an incomplete set of James Bond cards, especially considering the movies coming out in April. What a lot of people like to do is they like to get these cards and they like to go to conventions and they like to get people from the movies to sign these cards. And then they could sell the cards for a heck of a lot more money. And so someone might say, you know what, that's not bad. I'm going to get 55 of these cards for... You know, fourteen ninety nine, and I'm gonna take them to a convention that I'm going to, and I'm gonna get them. I'm gonna get a bunch of them signed by you know different people who were you know in the movie uh, either in the in the past or uh, maybe the more recent one or something like that. And so that might be a, that's the kind of person who I'm thinking of. Now again, I don't know how long is it gonna take for that person to come along. Is it gonna take a week? Is it gonna take two weeks, three weeks, or more? Who knows? But I know that person's out there because I see them selling the stuff on eBay. So I know they're there. And like, you know, just this morning, I mean, I put up a set of um, Star Wars card. Now that was a complete set and sold within about five minutes for uh, $22.50. Now that one was a complete set. It doesn't totally tie into this, but I'm just pointing out there are card people out there that will buy up uh, collections uh, pretty quickly, complete or not complete. And so don't always think the set has to be complete. It certainly does help, but it's not always, uh, always a necessity. So that's the basic summary of everything uh really again it's just about uh developing that uh and, and acquiring that that psychological uh insight into your buyer base and uh put trying to put yourself in their in their position trying to think of who the heck would possibly want this again remember going back to what i said earlier even if it's not something you care less about doesn't matter as long as some you don't have to like it you don't have to want to pay for it that's not what's important and too many people think that way you got to break out of that box you got to break out of that mindset and you just have to care about if there's someone else who wants it and there's someone else who wants to pay for it that's all that matters in the end so folks i hope you enjoyed the video if so make sure you subscribe to the channel make sure that you hit the like button. I've got to do a better job. Uh, I recently looked at statistics and saw that between 40 to 60% of people watching my videos are not subscribed. And I've got to do a better job of converting some of you over to subscribers. So please, it's important to subscribe uh, to the channel. There's a lot more features that I could offer you uh, if we get the subscriber count up. So that's one of the reasons that uh, is important. There's all sorts of things that could that could happen. There's all sorts of doors that open up. And so you can only do that with the sub count going up, folks. Uh, make sure you hit the like button. That is a very important as well. Comments down below, whatever uh, engagement uh, you would like to have with the channel. I always appreciate it. Uh, also, uh, make sure, by the way, I uh, mentioned my Facebook group. Come to that. We are just about ready to hit 14,000 subscribers, uh, not subscribers, members. Uh, so that's the Facebook Reselling Resource Center. The link is down below. And also my Instagram account. That's uh, at prime underscore time underscore treasure. Go check that one out. And I will see you back at the next video, everyone. Take care.